Next on Viewpoint. Don't ever give up. A woman shares her story of recovering from the pain of five miscarriages. Extravagant generosity. Once you make that transition, you'll never go back. A pastor says the best thing that his church is doing now is giving money away. This is the only road of salvation. A former journalist will share his viewpoint of why he believes there is only one way into heaven. Next. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. If infertility hasn't impacted your life, it likely has someone you might know. One out of eight couples have wrestled with the pain of starting a family, and on top of the emotional pain, seeking solutions can be very financially devastating. And Carol McLeod is with us today because she's walked that journey. She's had five miscarriages before she was blessed with her five children. She writes about her experiences in books and in her blog, and Carol joins us today on Viewpoint. Glad to have you with Thanks, us. Thanks, Bob. I'm glad to be here. And you got all that smile and all that joy. I do. It was probably the same smile you had the day you got married. I hope so. Yeah. I hope I have the same joy and excitement about life. And all of that getting married and starting a family and all that. Right. But, but things didn't go the way you really thought that they, they should, that, they, that you had planned. No, Craig and I had these two great little boys, and I loved being a mom. I'm one of these crazy women. I loved the peanut butter and jelly <laughs> fingerprints on my cabinet <laughs> doors. I loved tripping over matchbox cars in the middle of the night. Really? I <laughs> loved it all. And so we wanted to enlarge our family. Mm -hmm. So I got pregnant again and, and I lost the first baby at about 12 and a half weeks. And you know, that's not uncommon. That happens to a lot of women yeah. in a lot of families. So my doctor said, you're young, you can get pregnant again. Mm -hmm. And I got pregnant again and I lost the second baby at 15 weeks of my pregnancies. And, and then I got pregnant yeah. again. I was going to say, that's not, the, that's not the last of it. That's no, that's anyway. not the end of the story. I got pregnant again and lost the third baby at 16 weeks. I got pregnant again and lost the fourth baby at 19 weeks, five days. How did you not just say, I, I, this is too much, God. I've got, I, we can't do this again. I, I just can't get pregnant again. I just, I don't want to go through it. I don't want to take that, out, that chance. I, I think the reason I kept going, Bob, is I'm a very persistent person. And I believed that God had called Craig and I mm -hmm. to give the world a gift and to raise kingdom changing children. I wanted to raise the next Daniel. I wanted to raise the next Billy Graham. And I was persistent. I wasn't going to let so disappointment it was, it was, stop it was, it was a vision as well as it was, it a, was a desire. It was a calling. So it wasn't just the, the nurturing mother's desire to have more children. There was a vision and a calling. Exactly. And then I got pregnant again and lost the fifth one at about 16 weeks. So four of the babies I held in my hand. Oh, it's so, so hard mm -hmm. at the time. Were you alone when that happened? Um, most of the time my husband was with me. Mm -hmm. Several right. times I was at the, at the hospital because we were trying to save the mm -hmm. babies. But the fourth baby, Bob, at the 19 weeks and five days, we were going to the Duke Infertility Clinic in Durham, mm -hmm. North Carolina, one of the finest facilities in the world for women who were dealing with my issues. And the room was filled with neonatal specialists and doctors and interns and nurses. And my doctor's nurse was beside me because by then we were really good friends. Yeah. And, and I'll never forget it, Bob. Trish was sort of wiping my hair away. And she said, Carol, are you okay? And I said, yeah, Trish, I am okay. And my husband in that place at Duke Hospital began to sing, I love you, Lord, wow. and I lift my voice. And, and Bob, that place of our great pain became a holy moment. Mm -hmm. Doctors were weeping, nurses were crying as we worshiped the Lord in spite of our pain. How did you, I mean, you talk about Craig, how did, how did he even go on at that point? I mean, he's gotta be your, a rock in, in, in part of this. And he's seeing you go through this and no, no husband wants to see his wife suffer in this way. And these are deaths. How, do you re how does he recover and how does he handle that grief? Well, he's an extraordinary man. Let me say that, first of all. And he has a deep walk with the Lord. And, you know, honestly, Bob, we held each other yeah. up. Um, I know that sometimes going through tragedy like this weakens a marriage. For us, it strengthened our marriage. For us, we became more dependent on each other and on the Lord. But, Bob, we talked. We're communicators. Yeah. 
and we talked and cried and worshiped our way through that pain. So I, my advice would be keep talking, yeah. keep worshiping. Now how about people in that periphery, the, the, out, the people around you who are seeing the suffering and saying, Carol, really now? I mean, you, you got the well-meaning friends, not, not necessarily Lot's friends, but you got the well-meaning friends, or, or Job's friends, I mean, but you got the well-meaning friends who don't have that same vision, that same drive, and they're trying to, they're trying to do what they think is right for you. Oh, did you get that kind of counsel? Oh, I did. <laughs> I had yeah. Job's comforters in my <laughs> life. I'll never forget one Sunday after church. I, it was either after, after losing the fourth or the fifth baby. And so I looked horrible, and I'm weary, and I've been crying for the yeah. last two weeks, and I finally went to church. My husband's the pastor, and one of the elder's wives came up to me, and she said, well, Carol, now you know it's not God's will. See, that's, yeah. And I said, what's that, not God's that, will? Somebody hit you in the chest? Yes, yeah. yeah. And she said, it's not God's will for you to have a baby. And I, and I was sweet to her, Bob, because I'm a gracious person, but I thought to myself, you don't know that, and neither do I. Did and it really put me in fighting yeah. mode. I was ready to fight. Did she think she was speaking proph prophetically, or did she just she was just trying to be comforting? She was doing the best she could to comfort me. But Bob, one thing for people who are watching today that I had to decide is just go ahead in advance and forgive yeah. everybody for all the wrong things they're going to say because they're going to say them. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this it goes on from there yes. though. It yes. goes on from there, and part of that was that a, a miracle that happened. Christian television had something to do with this next step. What, what was that? Yeah, so after I lost the five babies, I couldn't get pregnant anymore. So then I was on high doses of fertility drugs to get pregnant, and it wasn't happening. And it was the week between Christmas and New Year in 1987. And my boys were outside playing. By then, they're big boys because yeah. the years have gone by. And I was watching Christian TV, folding blue washcloths. I remember You remember it. that. Well, I that's, remember that's it. impact. Yeah it's, yeah, it was a moment of impact for my life. And it was a pastor and his wife, and they're closing their TV show together. Mm -hmm. And the wife said, there's a pastor's wife out there. And I thought to myself, yeah, yeah. there are a lot of us, you know, <laughs> there are several of us. And she said, you have suffered repeated miscarriages. Wow. And I looked at the TV, and she said, you're pregnant now. And I said, I am? <laughs> and she said, walk in faith, not in fear, because this one's going to stick. And, you, and when she said that, you, you, you just knew and believed that she was speaking right to your heart. I did. Yeah. I did. I was weeping and, and thanking the Lord. And eight and a half months later, <laughs> I gave birth and you had no idea. to a full-term baby boy. Oh, praise God. Yeah. That is yeah. an amazing thing. Yeah. And that's not the end of it. No, it's not the end of it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a great miracle. but It was a wow. great miracle. And so I always say, because I'm selfish, I wanted another baby. And so I talked my fertility doctor into putting me back on fertility drugs. And after about eight months, he said to me, Carol, that's enough. What we have done to your body over the past 10 years, we're, we're done. And one month later, I got pregnant. <laughs> And it was Wait, a little. And you're off the drugs then? Off the drugs. Yeah. And when I called him to tell him, he said, "Well, it's the residual effect of the fertility drugs." And I said to him, like "No, pregnancy? it's not. It's a miracle." <laughs> and he said, "I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that." And so I gave birth to a little girl, and her name is Joy. Well, of course. Of course, because that's what you name a yeah. little girl after three boys. Yeah. You name her Joy. And that's not the end of my story. I was going to say, you said there's, there's five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And so three and a half years later, I got the flu, and it didn't go away. And I discovered I was pregnant. <laughs> it wasn't the flu. <laughs> oh. I didn't know I was pregnant until I was almost five months pregnant. And her name is Joni Rebecca, and she's wow. doing great things for the kingdom of God. That is, what are their ages now? So now my, my children are between ages 23 and 37. Oh, goodness. That's, and, and within all that's a, a whole lot of grandchildren. Yes, yeah, seven so far. So far. So far. Yes, yes. Now, there, there are women out there, just as right. that pastor's wife spoke into your heart, there's mm -hmm. women out there right now, and they're saying, wow, I, w I want to see if, I, if God's speaking to me. What, what would you tell them right now if they've been struggling and struggling or maybe had a couple of miscarriages, and, and they either feel all alone, they don't know how to get through the grief, how do I go on? Uh, speak to them once. Well, you know, in a practical sense, Bob, I'd say find a great doctor. Find an infertility doctor that really <laughs> knows what he's doing, he or she is doing, so they can help you in a practical medical way. Don't waste time, um, but, but find the, the most well-respected doctor in your area 
and go to him. And, and secondly, I would say, stay in a place of hope. Believe that God has babies for you. Don't ever give up. Um, I could have given up when that elder's wife said to me, now you know, and it would have been okay. Mm -hmm. It would have been okay. But stand in faith and let's always remember that sometimes God brings babies biologically. Yeah. Sometimes he brings them through adoption or through foster care. And then some women are called to be spiritual moms as mm -hmm. well. So often I will tell women, listen, if your soul is aching for babies, go work in the church yeah. nursery. Go teach Sunday school. Invest your life in the next generation and see what God will do for you. And all that nurturing spirit yes. will, will come through. Yes. So there's a woman out there right now that's aching to have that baby. Mm -hmm. And uh, she doesn't know what God's... I mean, she's just not sure if it's God's will that she goes on. Would you pray for her? I would love to pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you so much. And Father, I'm praying right now for the women who are listening, who are aching to have a baby. Lord, your word says that children are a blessing from the Lord. So Father, I call down a blessing from heaven this very day in the lives of the women and the men who are listening. Father, I, I pray right now, um, that you will bless these women listening just like you blessed Sarah and Abraham, just like you blessed Hannah and Elkanah, just like you blessed Elizabeth and Zacharias. Lord, would you bless those who are listening with babies. Would you fill their quivers? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Coming up next, a former journalist will share his viewpoint of why he believes there is only one way into heaven. Next. For many years, we've seen it on signposts on the, in the highway. We've, we've heard, read it in books, but Jesus saves. And what does he save us from? And are Christians so narrow-minded that we think that Jesus really is the only way to eternal life? Well, with me is Bill Harris. Bill, you've been a TV journalist. You've been a teacher. You've done a lot of things in your life, but you've, you've believed that Jesus Christ really saves. Amen. What does he save us from? He saves us from our sins. We, we, we seem not to understand sometimes that because of the sin of our forefathers, Adam and Eve, that sin was like a disease, so to speak. It just spread throughout the whole human race, meaning that now judgment and punishment await all of humanity, except for the fact that Jesus stepped in and took the punishment from us and for us. Why did it have to be Jesus? See, God in his own infinite wisdom could not send a choice angel. He could not send a regular human being. It had, to be, it had to be a special sacrifice that met God's specifications or qualifications. And the only one who qualified was his own son. So he pulled his own son out of his bosom and sent him down. And he, he, he died first. Now, he, here's the point. While he was on that cross, Bob, remember this, that when God looked down on him, he no longer saw his son. What he saw was the flesh of the prostitute, the flesh of the drug addict, the flesh of the alcoholic, the flesh of the schizophrenic, the flesh of the mentally retarded, the flesh of the white beer. He saw your flesh. He saw my so flesh. All the sickness, so all the disease, all, all the sin is that hanging on. Hanging on Jesus because all of that was imputed to him. And because God is offended by sin, God turned his back on his own son. I mean, God the Father and God the Holy Spirit stepped back and left Jesus to die alone. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The desertion was real because God is offended by sin. So he, he became the living sacrifice there on that cross, but it didn't end there. Upon his death, he went down into the grave and he suffered the full assault of hell. All that you and I yeah. would go through in hell, he went through it those three See, that's days. That's one thing we, we very seldom talk about is, is we, we kind of end it with the, the cross and then begin it again with resurrection. Uh -huh. But there was, there, was, not only, there was three days. In he that. not only died for you, he went to hell for you. Nobody under the side of my voice has to go to hell. If anybody, if you go to hell, it's because you choose to. You don't have to because Jesus is the only one who qualified himself by the way he died, qualified himself to be the only way. But there's that, there's that good person living out there. Mm -hmm. They have been mm -hmm. good all their life. Yes. They've never, they know, offended anybody. And if they yeah. did, they asked. But they've never imputed, the, I mean, they've never received Jesus Christ yeah. as Lord and Savior. Now, 
is God going to send them to hell? Or has he just provided this very narrow road that they can, are they on their way there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. We get asked this all the time. Even though that person is, quote unquote, a good person, as mm -hmm. we're calling it, let's understand that person has the nature of sin. As I mentioned earlier, because of the sin of Adam and Eve, that, that sinful nature and death coming with it mm -hmm. le leads to the condemnation of that person. If they knowingly reject Jesus Christ and do not and do not want the message that is telling them that even though you are a good person, you're still not good enough without Christ because of all that Christ went through for you. God will never negate what Christ went through to allow people to get to him. This is why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the father but by me. Jesus is the gatekeeper. So there's not a lot of roads out there. I mean, if we're there a very a good person roads, and right. I worship the trees and I love the earth, I mean, it's yeah, it, it, not it, a lot of roads. And the reason, the reason God made it so narrow is not that God is narrow-minded, per se, in the negative sense that we think about. It is the fact that God doesn't want you to miss it. This is the only road of salvation. This is the only plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Remember, God is a planner. He has a plan for your life, but he also has a plan of salvation. And this is the only plan that God set up. He did not set up multiple plans in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. He wants everybody to come through his son. And even in the final analysis, when we get to the end of this world, all things are going to be under Jesus Christ because he qualified himself mm -hmm. by becoming human. He was God, the son in heaven. He took off his royal robe, Bob, and put on a robe of flesh and went through the school of humanity for 33 years so that he could be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. Mm -hmm. Nobody else qualifies for that. Buddha doesn't qualify. Mm -hmm. Confucius doesn't qualify. Nobody else qualifies because they have not, and he died. And not only that, Jesus is the only God who predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off. <laughs> no other God has ever happened done that. just it. like he said. Yes, happened just like he said. The Bible is also a history book, mm -hmm. right? Three so, 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 we, so we know Jesus is in there, and this is, he's a person, and he was crucified. So I, can I just believe, I, I believe that Jesus is there. Do I believe in him like I believe in this table? I mean, I see them both, yeah. I, I, but, but how do I really believe? What, what yeah, is the difference between this table's not going to save me? That's right. So what's the difference in those two beliefs? Well, it, 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 the key word is belief because we are asked to believe a God that we cannot see mm -hmm. because God is a God of faith and all that he does is based on faith. I mean, think about this world. When, when, when he brought this world into, into existence, it was by faith. He simply spoke it. And the world came into being. God is a God of faith. And when he was dealing with the disciples, remember Thomas was not there when yeah. Jesus came mm -hmm. back after the resurrection. Jesus made a special trip to come back for so Thomas. Thomas could see. Yeah, so he could see him, you know, to, to touch the nail, nail prints in my hand and, my, and the, the, the wound in my side and the like. And, but he said, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe mm -hmm. because God operates on faith and he wants us right. to be the same way. When you sit down in this chair, you don't sit to look and say, well, is this chair going to hold me up? You just sit in it by faith. You just, hey, it's going to hold me up. God wants simplistic faith to be operated on our part. That sounds, that may sound like very far-fetched, but God is a God of faith. We are, we are to love him even though we haven't seen him. Okay, and there, there's somebody out there right now that's saying that, that sounds pretty far-fetched to me. Mm -hmm. they, they know about Jesus. They've heard about him along with Confucius and everybody else. And they're saying, okay. I, I'm hearing what you're saying, Bill. Uh, how, how, do I, how do I make this belief real in my life? How do I make that faith come alive in my life? Would you, would you speak to them and, sure. and, and, and show them what, they need, what sure. they need to do? I would say that for anybody that, that is out there, no matter what your situation, no matter what your background, no matter what color you are, what side of the tracks you were born on, it doesn't matter. All you need to do is acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that he died for you and that you want to accept him now as your Lord and Savior. And if you just repeat this simple prayer, it's, we call it the sinner's prayer in, in Christianity. You say, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me for my sins. I acknowledge that you died and rose again for me. And now I accept you as my Lord and Savior, 
and I will live for you from this time forward. Amen. And you just became a born again Christian. It's just that simple. When you confess and you really mean it in your heart, that's all it takes, Bob. That's all it takes. And, they, and they, they move on with their life from there? or yeah. they? I would suggest, I recommend, as I used to do on my program all the time, that you get into a good Bible-believing church mm -hmm. so that you can be taught, so that you can learn how to grow in this new Christian walk that you've just taken on. Coming up next. Extravagant generosity, beyond what is absolutely necessary. Once you make that transition, you'll never go back. Next. Mark Bayless has been a pastor for many years and he believes that his church is going through a transformation and can all be summed up in two words, be generous. Yeah. Pastor, glad to have you here. Thank you, Bob. Uh, hasn't the church always been generous? I think it wants to be generous yeah. and in many ways it is. You've been, as a pastor, I've got to, I've got to build brick and mortar and I've got yeah. to do these things. Yeah. Has, that, has that changed inside the church? It's changed at our church mm -hmm. in, in a big way and you use the word transformational mm -hmm. and it has and I'm not sure I could point to a time exactly but we had a young man in our church who was at Fort Wayne at not Fort Wayne Bible College but but he was at Taylor University mm -hmm. studying for the ministry and his background was that he had his teeth were so bad that he would end up in the emergency room with infections and mm -hmm. and so yeah. his family told me that they needed about fifteen hundred dollars to to do the work that was needed. Mm -hmm. And so I went to our board and I said, let's help him and let's pay that. And at that time, there was not the, the it, it was not an, a lack of generosity, but there wasn't the intent to be generous by the definition we're talking about. Uh, I talked to our board and uh, one of them said very graciously, well, pastor, if we do that, I'm afraid that will start a precedent. Uh -huh. And my response was, let's, let's do this and see, let's start a precedent, mm -hmm. and let's see what God will do. And I just, keep, I just keep pounding away at the simple concept, everything about God is generosity. And so he's looking for, and I've used these exact mm -hmm. words many times, he is looking for churches to pour himself through in ways that other churches who've closed themselves off to this idea and they keep it all for themselves and other people, they can't help, that God is looking for churches to pour himself through. And so in this approximately 10 year period, our budget has not quite doubled. The number of people is about the same, but the budget and the giving has almost doubled in 10, 12 years. And that's got to be because these people feel like that, 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 that they're being this conduit, this money's flowing they are. through them. That's right. And they're seeing a real need being met. Was there ever, ever any fear in the deacon's board or within the church that we're, we're just going to become a, a grocery store for people? That The, the word's going to get out. Yes. And we're going to get calls 18 times a day from people saying, uh, we, I, I need my yep. rent paid. I need this yep. paid. I need that paid. Did you ever feel like you were going to just become the... I guess the, the patsy in this case. Uh, well, uh, here's how we handled that. Our shepherd's fund is run primarily by our two administrative assistants. Mm -hmm. And for instance, if you called, they qualify you and ask you about your they, situation. They know how to do that. They write everything down. You call back next month. They say, well, we helped you last month. I'm sorry, we can't help you this month. We've had people call and lie to us, which you'd expect. Mm -hmm. People have real needs. People abuse the system if they can. And some people would call and change their name with the same address and phone number. And so if people lie to us, we just say, we're not going to help you. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. uh, but people who have genuine need, especially children, um, we really hold the line on that as best we can. Mm -hmm. We do. And as a pastor starting this out, when you, when you first, this vision or however God moved you, yes. there's pastors out there now saying, yeah, we, we've, got, we've got to break through this. What, what are you going to say to that pastor? How do, how do you get, get that board and that group of people to, to grab a hold of that vision with you? How do you do that? Um, they have to. I had to. And I mm -hmm. believe every family, individual, pastor, businessman, whoever it is, they have to reach a place where they say God is who he says he is or not. Mm -hmm. And if he is who he says he is, then when it tells us to be generous, to sow seed uh, everywhere and expect a bountiful harvest, th the whole principle of giving, sowing and reaping, not to receive, but to grow a harvest, it, it, you have to put God to the test and say, God, we're going to step out in faith and do X, Y, or Z. 
and see what God does. That's, that's the key. In this case, he's, he's been very good to his word. Oh, my work. goodness. He's very good to his word. And, and, and the final thing I want to share with you as we wind this thing down a little bit, I've told our folks, once you make the transition to generosity, extravagant generosity, beyond what is absolutely necessary, once you make that transition, you'll never go back. You'll never go back. If you found this program for the first time, you may have been surprised to hear viewpoints like these. Well, we want to continue to produce programs on these relevant topics, but to do so, we need your financial support of people like you. Your financial gift to help us continue Viewpoint is greatly appreciated.